Hey church, welcome to Glow. My name is Christy and this is Andy and we are so excited that you've joined us today and happy Father's Day. Yes, here in Australia, it is Father's Day. So wherever you're joining us from, a big happy Father's Day to you. Hey, why don't you put in the comments below where you are from and some of our team would love to connect with you throughout the service. Uh, here in Australia, we don't hold services at night time because we actually want our families to connect and be with their fathers. Yeah. And so today's service is from our morning service and we're hearing from our senior pastor, Pastor Joel. So we hope you enjoy this. That everyone right now that is joining us from Glow UK, from all around the world, people listen to our podcast this morning. We want to say a huge welcome from the Gold Coast. It is Father's Day in Australia. I know it's not over in New Zealand there. I know in Australia it's uh, Father's Day. And I know that in America and in uh, England it's not Father's Day. But hey, we're the one preaching, you're listening. So we're going to enjoy it. And we're glad that you are joining us. And I'm going to believe that this word this morning is going to help see something different. Barack Obama, uh, ex-president of America, he said this. He said, any fool can have a child. That doesn't make you a father. It's the courage to raise the child that makes you a father. An unknown source said this. A father is someone that you look up to no matter how tall you grow. Steve Martin, famous actor, said, a father carries pictures where his money used to be. <laughs> that must have been post-Father the Bride. I mean, it must have been just after that. A father carries pictures where his money used to be. These days, it's probably all digital. You know, you know, but how true is that? I mean, anyone who's ever had to fund a wedding, any dads here, uh, I'm starting to save up for that. There's going to be a, a strict uh, recruitment process and a strict criteria on that, but that's okay. It's, it's, we all have to have our own processes. And Harmon Kilbury said, my father used to play with my brother and me in the yard, my mother would come out and say, hey, you're tearing up all the grass. We're not raising grass, Dad replied, we're raising boys. I know in a room like this, I'm about to say some words that could trigger you. Dad, Father, Daddy God. Actually, I just said that word because it was a dare from my daughter. She said, you'll never say that in church. I said, well, I just did. I'll take that money off you, thank you, Taylor. But you'll never hear me before you ever say it again other than a dare. But those words, those trigger words can bring emotions into our life depending on the season that you're currently walking in. Maybe you've had an incredible example of, a, of an earthly father and you're so thankful for that example. For others of you, maybe this morning, it's a tender one because you never knew your dad, which makes it challenging to even want to be here this morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being brave. Maybe in recent times, I know that there has been a number of dads in our church pass away. Uh, some during COVID uh, overseas and people tragically had to watch their, their loved one pass away via Zoom. That's really hard. Yeah. I think of a beautiful girl in Sydney, an only, an only daughter, right there in Sydney, could not enter the hospital, had to watch it all happen on Zoom. And it just broke her heart and I think would break all of our hearts. It's tender. We, we think of you this morning, and again, the fact that you're in church this morning, you're bold and you're courageous, and we honor you this morning. Yeah. There are people here, and you would say, if you had to describe your dad, maybe he was in of your life, out of your life, in your life, out of your life, and so the inconsistencies have caused chaos on your inner world without knowing truly what does a consistent father look like in all seasons, no matter what you're going through. Maybe you looked at other dads and thought to yourself, I wish that was my dad. Oh, I wish I had a dad. And maybe you're a dad here this morning and you feel like a failure. You feel like you haven't quite lived up to hopefully what you said that you would never be. And I want to encourage you this morning, listen to me carefully. Why not start today? Why not make a line in the sand decision and say, I'm going to change and I'm going to be the dad that I wish I had. I'm going to be the dad that I know my kids need. In 1924, in a Spanish village, a fairly large town, there was a dad who had just come back from World War I fighting. And that particular dad, for whatever reason, maybe a little bit like Pastor Tom sharing his story this morning. Thank you, Tom, for sharing that. It was really amazing, actually. But he probably was traumatised from what he had seen during World War I. And before the war, he was married and he had one son called Paco. 
Sadly, at the end of that experience in 1924, he had realised that he had let his family down and he had left his wife and he had left this son to fight for himself with his mum. The dad feeling like a sense of responsibility many years later, he decided that he would try and get in touch with Paco in order to restore and make things right. I don't know if he had an encounter with God, I don't want to fill the gaps in, I don't know what triggered that, but he decided he was going to get things back on track and build that bridge if Paco would be willing. So he took out a full page advertisement in the local newspaper. And he wrote these words, Paco, I am looking for you. You're going to think there's no Instagram, there's no SMS, there's no, there's pigeons probably. You know, like, Paco, I'm looking for you. I'm asking if you would forgive me. I want to be back in your life. If you would be willing to forgive me, would you meet me this Saturday on the town hall steps for us to reconcile? Saturday came, this is a true story, over 800 Pacos turned up. 800. Not tacos, Pacos turned up. All looking for their dad to be in reconciliation with them. It probably was a byproduct of what had happened during World War I. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a tragic story in the same sense of like 799 Pacos went home disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it stirred a sense of reconciliation amongst the Pacos of that village. But isn't it amazing, the longing of a child for a father, yeah. the longing potentially of a son or a daughter towards a dad's heart, if a dad is willing to, I read a quote this week about when dad walks in a room and if he smiles, the whole family's happy. Yeah. That's a challenging thought. It's a challenging thought that if dad's smiling, that the whole family, there feels a lightness. Yeah. Sometimes as men, we can carry the weight of the world. As parents, I know in this room here, we honor, we've got some amazing single moms here. We've got, Chris, we just talked about a single dad. We've got so many people with so many emotions, so many experiences. But I want to tell you today that we're going to land this plane somewhere that no matter where you're at or what you feel, there's something in store for you today. When we had our first daughter, Taylor, which is almost 17 years ago now. It was in Sydney. It was at Royal North Shore Hospital where I was born. And it was a 42, de 42 degree day and Ellen was about hour 40 of labour. And when Taylor was born, and by the way, I know, you know we talk about as men that, you know, well, the whole, you know, we're going to be a parent, but let's, let's be honest for a second. Look, I think the women in the room are the hero. <laughs> let's be honest, even as Father's Day, but if it wasn't for you... And we're at the end zone ready to catch. I mean, come on, like, like, come on, let's give it up for all the mums this morning. I know it's not Mother's Day, but let's be honest. We get the fun part, you get the hard part. Touchdown. And out comes Taylor. And the first two minutes of her life was me as an emotional mess. And I didn't see it coming. It was like this wave of emotion just came over the top of me. And I was just like, I was 25. And as... The baby, uh, as Taylor was lifted up in the air, before she was born, I, I mean, I really wasn't caring if it was a boy or a girl, and I think, as long as this baby's healthy, and but for two minutes, literally, me and Ellen, we're crying, you know, it's, it's all happening, and eventually I'm like, is it a boy or a girl? And they're like, congratulations, you've got a girl. And as a dad, my heart was like, oh. Because in that moment, you know, the boys are the girl. I mean, we didn't know. We, we weren't the ones who were going to have these crazy parties and pop balloons and, like, that's, that's so consumeristic. Anyway, we'll, all, these new, all these, new, these new things that are coming in. I saw a funny YouTube video this week of somebody was bringing this big balloon out of one of the ultrasound places and it hit the desk and it popped in front of the parents and they're just like... Talk about how to... I mean, how do you go back from there? Put it back in the balloon. That lady probably got fired. But, you know, it's just a, it is a challenge, right? Because no one said, hey, Joel and Ellen, here's an instruction manual on how to be a unique parent to this unique child. I could watch all the videos in the world about being a parent, but it doesn't necessarily help me because my daughter's wired differently to yours. Your parent's different to me. My experiences are different. My emotions are different. And so there's no one manual that's going to say, that's how you do it. Probably most likely... Psychologists would tell me 
that the way that I was parented by my dad is going to have a direct effect about the manual that I pull out. And the way that he was parented is also going to then also reflect in how I'm going to parent from generation to generation. I believe in this room this morning, there's some parents up in this place, there's some, there's some dads in this place that are going to change the legacy of their families based on the fact that maybe you never had it, but you're going to be the one to say, that, that grandfather of mine, man, Uncle Henry, he changed the whole legacy lot because of how he chose to adapt. He chose to change. And no matter where you're at this morning, I think it's fair to say that based on the emotion that was triggered when I said earlier those different words, we can't help but view God through that same lens as a father. When I say the words like, God is a good father, some of you are like, I don't know about that. God is our provider. I'm like, well, I didn't have much on the table. I don't know if I can trust that God can do that for me. And we can frame so much about our natural disappointment in life and put it on God and He's sitting there going, what? What did, I, what did I do? Other than stay true to my word. And someone needs to hear this here this morning that God is faithful to His word. If God said He'll do it, He'll do it again. We sang that song this morning, same God. He is the same God of the Bible in the stories that were crazy with your Joshua's and your David's and the Goliath being slain. He's that same God as he is right now post-COVID in a world that's gone crazy. He wants to meet you where you're at. He wants to do impossibly. He is waiting for you to say, God, I need you. Father, I need you. Even if my life experience would not say that my dad or my lack of dad or my dad that's missed me, that he is still not good. That he's still not going to come through for you this morning. That he's going to turn up in your moment of need and be true to his word. Now this week, as I was preparing the message, I felt the Holy Spirit kept leading me to this bizarre story that doesn't make sense for fathers. Until as I've been unpacking it today, I feel like this is not a bad message of what God has been showing me. And I want to speak for a moment about a guy that we would probably say, actually not we would probably say, the Bible tells us is a hero of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 says this. By faith, everyone say this next word. Wow. Can we do that again? So some of you like, I was on my phone. I was like, what was that? By faith. Noah. No, we almost said, by faith, Noah. Noah. When warned about these things that had not been seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. And by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Now, in this particular story, we would all agree, what a hero. Noah is the man. Noah has saved the world. Now, I don't want to presume that you know everything, but I think even if you've never been to church before, there's a good chance you would be able to identify that Noah built an ark. The problem is you might not be able to identify the fact that there'd never been one built before that time. Actually, it had never rained before. How do you build something for that that you've never seen before, for something you've never heard of before? So I could imagine that during this time that Noah was building the boat, could you imagine the bullying that would have happened amongst his kids? Back at school, like, mate, that dad has gone loopy. This guy's building this, whatever that thing is called, for something that no one's ever heard of. Man, I reckon these kids might have been embarrassed. Like, like, I hope that's right, but probably not looking good. Next thing, he's gone even more crazy and he's Dr. Doolittle calling all the animals in. Could he not have left the snakes and the cockroaches away? Rats are okay, but, you know, like, you can manage those. It's a good, you know, like if they come, but... Snakes, they're sneaky. They turn up in a baby's cot when you didn't know about it. So that's pretty, pretty deep, isn't it? But I reckon there's a good chance that on the other side of him being a hero of faith, I reckon his kids could have paid the price. Until the rain came. Until all of a sudden that ark looked like a very, very exciting holiday to be a part of. As people's scuba stopped working. As their snorkels got taken up. And after they sailed off on the carnival cruise ark. 
problem was for these kids, they couldn't say, I told you so. They couldn't Facebook it. They couldn't Instagram it. They couldn't say, hey, my dad's better than yours. They would have cops and criticism. There would have been a real sense for them that my dad, I don't know what is going on here, but hopefully he knows what's going on. I think it would be fair to say, post them getting off the ark, would we agree that Noah was a hero, not only in our eyes, but in their eyes. He probably was elevated to a place of like, this guy, he's from God. This guy saved the world. The Bible said he was a man of righteousness that couldn't be found elsewhere. A man of faith that couldn't see things that no one else could see. And yet here we are about to read another part of his life that at the same time goes, those two don't seem to work together. We like to read the good stories and we like to cheer for the great teams. But what happens when a Genesis chapter 9 happens in your life? Let me read this this morning. Noah, the same guy, not a different version, Noah. And by the way, the flood happened 600 years into Noah's life. So he's got a pretty good track record for 600 years. Must have been a pretty ripped guy, hey, look, building that ark. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. Nice. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Other versions say he was naked. He was naked. Verse 22, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked, this is one of the sons, and told his two brothers outside. Now, at first glance, you say, what a, what a simple story. Theologians would go on to say that the wording of this is similar to like, and Adam and Eve knew each other. And that means that they created life for all those that are understanding me this morning. They were getting it on. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's like, <laughs> so in this particular scenario, we've got a situation where there's more than just meets the eye because the reaction of Noah tells us something serious went down. I don't want to presume upon that, but we do think that there was something that went down where it possibly was to do with one of the sons trying to rise up in the family and actually like take, I am in charge. But Shem and Japheth, there's two other brothers, took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. And when they walked in backward, so they walked in back and they covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so they could not see their father naked. When Noah awoke from his wine and found that his youngest son had done what he'd done to him, he said, curse be Canaan. This is pretty heavy stuff. Curse be Canaan. And the lowest of slaves will be to his brothers. He also said, praise be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. What a crazy story about a guy who had a great reputation. Noah got messed up. Maybe he was having a post-ark celebration and it went too far. But the consequences of his actions in the moment led to some crazy scenarios that were played out in a very short space of time. Here's some of the dynamics going on when I look at the scriptures. We've got a father who's done the wrong thing. Yep, that's probably true. We have one son who decides to behave in a certain manner. We also have two other sons that take a different approach and behave in a whole other manner. I mean, it's a big thing for one to come out and make jokes and, and possibly do things that he shouldn't have done and for two brothers to honour their father in a way that says, I refuse to look. I refuse to even listen to what he had to say. And they put that cloak on, they go backwards. They lay it down. And I, I don't know the scenario. And we're not talking about one of these tents we just saw here. This would have been their home, their house. The guy that they looked up to and said, we esteem this guy. Yeah, he's had a bad moment. The other brother said, I'm going to be opportunistic right now. We have the responses that we can't see in the moment because responses always start in our heart. The issues of life flow from where? From the heart. The actions are a direct result of what happens in here. So we have now got a picture of responses to a situation from both a father and the children. Yeah. Noah stuffed up, but whatever was in Ham's heart came out. Yeah. Whatever was in the other son's heart also came out in a different way. How true it is in life that when all of a sudden moments take place, the tragedy, the concern, maybe a, a, a trial that goes on in your life, maybe the business is in big problems, Maybe something has happened with your father. Maybe there's something that's happened to you with your parents. 
Some of you here have had to face the most challenging circumstances of a messy divorce as a kid in that process. Or some of you here may be going through that process yourself and you don't know what's up and down. But what we see is the direct result in action because something happened in here first. Listen to me carefully today. We know the Word of God tells us that storms will come our way. Trials will come our way. And you need to guard your heart when the storm comes. You need to protect who's around you when it comes because it could dictate the response you give in an action because your heart is shaped in that moment. No matter how much you want to prepare for a worse moment, your heart will take you in a direction. Two brothers chose to respond with grace, love, and honor and to cover their dad. And yet Ham treated him with a way with dishonor and tried to take the mantle. His opportunistic nature came through his actions. And in every season we're in, when there's something that happens, you and I have choices. You and I have opportunities to honor and dishonor. You and I have opportunities to gossip or to shut it down. You and I have opportunities to act like God would act with biblical framework and be like Jesus in a moment, or we act just like the world that brings nothing but destruction through our words and our action. I want you to write this statement down. I've been processing it this week. I think it's very important. When things don't go wrong in life, I'm going to give you the back end of this so we can watch this later. When something happens in our life where maybe someone lets you down, maybe it could be your father, a figure, a mom, whatever it could be, someone that you esteem and look up to like these sons would have. While we don't get to choose the situation, we do get to choose our response. While we don't get to choose the situation, we do get to choose our response. I say it once more so that the people in the back row can hear me this morning. We don't get to choose the situation, but we do get to choose our response. When tough things happen to you, how do you respond? What's your natural inclination? Well, I'm a negative person. I always look for the bad. I'm always going to go through the, oh, I told you I was, I was waiting for that to happen. My go- or are the kind of people that say, hey, Grace would say, hey, we've all stuffed up. Hey, man, I need mercy. I want to make sure that I give that to people. Forgiveness, well, man, 10 times already this morning I need forgiveness. And yet we choose in those moments because we elevate a person or a situation above who God determines that they'll be in our life. See, God is the only one who's perfect. God is the only one who can come through on every promise. And when we start to think that people in our lives, I'm going to tell you this, if you go to this church, I'll let you down at some point. I don't mean to. It could be from, I didn't walk past you and say hello. Ellen's going to really let you down, but I'll do my best not to. <laughs> but we're all, we're all there, right? We, we've all put someone somewhere that's an unhealthy thing. Yeah. We replace people with where God should be in our life. And then we judge people based on the fact that we put them in that place and not where it's the wrong, we're the wrong way. And I wonder if this church would be known as the kind of people. I wonder if this church would be known as the kind of place on the Gold Coast where others might treat someone some way that we're the sort of people that say, I want to do things God's way and I'll keep speaking life and purpose and life and mission and forgiveness and grace and mercy because you know what? There's already enough negativity in the world we live in. What would it look like for you to respond differently to your default position? Let me tell you, what would it look like for you to move away from your default position and respond the way God does? We've got father's responses. We've got children's responses. And I read this story this week. And maybe I'm the only one here that it hit my heart. I'm about to read it and you'll know whether it hit you too. And I don't want to even go off script. I want to read this as it was written. A true story that maybe many of us can relate to this morning. Whether you are the father, whether you're the, the child, the son or the daughter in a situation that maybe says that's a bit too close to home. A man came home from Work late again. If the keyboards can come and join me, actually, that'd be really good. Josh, can you come and join me? Not ready in and out of season, right there. Oh. Wow. Ever since you got in, 
uh, dating Sarah, you just a lot more punctual. punctual. Did you like me as a school teacher? Okay, good. We used to watch Shark Tank a lot. That's why I liked it. Okay, a man came home from work late again. He was tired and he was irritated. Has anyone else ever done that before? I know I'm guilty. Stuff happens, right? Sometimes the people closest to us, they, they're on the receiving end because they're safe, they're at home. He found his five-year-old son waiting for him at the door saying, Daddy, can I ask you a question? The dad replied, yeah, for sure, what is it? Daddy, how much money do you make an hour? And the dad got mad and said, that's none of your business. Why do you want to know? The little boy said, I just want to know. Please tell me, how much do you make an hour? And the dad, wanting to sit down and relax, said, if you must know, I make $20 an hour. And the little boy sighed and bowed his head. Looking up, he asked, Daddy, can I please borrow $10, please? The father flew off the handle. If the only reason you wanted to know how much money I make so that you could just hit me up straight away for some extra cash to buy some stupid toy or some other thing that I don't really care about, then you march yourself straight to your room and you can go to bed. You're so selfish, son. I work long, hard hours every day and I don't have time for this. The little boy quietly went to his room and he shut the door. And the dad sat down and started to even get madder about the nerve of this little boy and the questions he would ask. How dare he ask questions about getting more money? Does he not know how hard I work? And after an hour or so, the man had calmed down and started to think that maybe he was being a bit hard on his boy. Maybe his son really needed that money for something important and he forgot to ask him. And so the father went up to the boy's room and he opened and he said, hey, son, are you asleep still? And a little voice came out and said, no, daddy, I'm awake. I've been thinking maybe I was too hard on you earlier, said the dad. It's been a long day and I took it out on you. So here is the $10 that you asked for from me. The little boy sat up. He was beaming. He said, thank you, daddy, he exclaimed. They're reaching under his pillow. He pulled out a wad of scrumpled up dollar bills. The dad, seeing that the boy already had some money, actually started to get angry again. And the little boy slowly counted out his money and he looked up at his dad. The dad, now ticked off, demanded to know what was going on. Why do you want more more of my money that I've worked hard for when you already had some under your pillow? And the little boy replied, because I didn't have enough, but now I do, Daddy. I have $20 now and I'd like to buy an hour of your time. I don't know about you, but it hits me pretty hard. So often the people that are around us, whether it's our friends, our family, our sons, maybe you've experienced a dad that was always busy. I'm just thankful this morning that we don't have a God who's too busy for us. That He's always willing to hear our requests. He's always willing to come and comfort us. He's always willing to come and like open the door when others might not say, hey, it'll be okay. I wonder if maybe that story would help some of us dads here to go, hey, I can't miss those moments. I've got to ask more questions. I know it challenged me. Dads aren't perfect. We never were ever going to be because we're all sinned. We're all fallen short of the glory that only truly that Jesus could live up to. But how do you view God? If the team want to come and join me. When life doesn't go as planned, or doesn't fit the script that maybe you have thought through would be what God wanted for you. There were three sons. One responded one way and two responded the other. Now hear me carefully this morning. You are someone who is a believer in Jesus. And if you stay true to who He says He is and the word that God gives us from His word. When things happen in people's lives, You don't have to respond like everyone else. Sometimes I think we get around the wrong way that because everyone says one thing that we lose our own personal conviction of what God says is the framework for response. 
And I want to encourage you, those of you watching online today, those of you listening to the podcast, those in the room, those who have been in the services already, listen to me carefully this morning. When it comes to our response, develop your own God conviction. You don't have to be the same as everyone at work. You don't have to be the same as everyone in your class at school. You don't have to be the same as the people at your university. You don't have to be the same as everyone online making comments. You don't have to even be the same as everyone else in your family. But you need to develop some kind of rationale that says, hey, I know that I have to respond a different way. I don't want my heart response to not match what God says is His hits. And I'm telling you this morning, if you have had that experience where maybe dad has been vacant, where maybe he hasn't been around, where maybe he hasn't been a great example, you get to choose the response, but you don't get to choose the circumstance. I wish that could change, but I've got some good news for you this morning. Anyone want some good news up in here this morning? I'll, come on. Anyone want some good news this morning? I'll give you some good news this morning because the more I read in the Word of God, the more I realise that God is who He says He is. The more I realise that God doesn't respond to the way that we respond, that God is going to turn up in our time of need. Psalm 107 verse 1 says, We give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Everyone say this morning, He is good. Good. We're almost there. Everyone together. He is good. Now say it like you deeply mean this this morning. Even if you don't, I want you to get it in your spirit. He is good. He's good. He's good. He's good. He's good. Numbers. Chapter 23, verse 9 says, God is not a man, so He does not lie. He is not a human, so he does not change his mind. He has ever spoken, has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? That's the God, that's our Father. That's our Dad. That says no matter what you've gone through, no matter where you're at right now, no matter the seasons you walk through, he is faithful. He has got your back.